Kamala Harris is going to lose. I, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying right now is not exactly going to be groundbreaking because I know you already feel it, don't you? As you look around, all the radio, all the TV, all the news stories, it feels like she's going to lose. And, and, and I try the best I can not to ever put myself and you in any kind of a bubble where we don't have perspective, where we can't see things. I know inevitably we're all going to be in a bubble anyway. We want to live, work, and worship around people who share our values. Our friends are going to be people who share our values. So we create for our own selves bubbles. We all do it. I do it. You do it. Everyone does it. But what I'm about to say, I feel it. Don't you feel it? It feels like not only does Trump have all the momentum, it feels like Kamala Harris is just simply historically bad. And as unbelievable as this sounds, I think Joe Biden would have done better. I, I, I don't get me wrong, it's not that I think Joe Biden would have won, but I think Joe Biden, even with his brain gone, would have been better than Dome. She's just historically bad. Uh, digest this for a moment, digest this for a moment. If she does lose, and it feels like she's going to lose, and I'll give you my reasons why in just a moment. I have some specific reasons, but if she does lose, think for a moment about all the things, all the different extremely powerful entities that are not only on her side, that really undersells it. They're not only full-out campaigning for her, but they have been calling Donald Trump Adolf Hitler for 10 years. So... All these people, the media, the education system, Hollywood, the government itself, all of them completely in the tank for dome. All of them calling Donald Trump a Nazi. And yet, she's losing? And more than just losing? I feel like there's a social stigma now about voting for her. Yeah, in the way that there was for Trump. Now, let me, let me clarify. I don't think you ever held a social stigma, whether you voted for Trump or not. Maybe you're a Trump super fan. Maybe you're on the right, but you don't like it for one reason. But you would never have voted or not voted for him based on a social stigma. But let's be frank. In 2016 and 2020, because of the power of those institutions and their propaganda, Trump's Hitler, Trump's Hitler, there was kind of a... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for Trump, but I'm going to do it quietly. There was kind of a lot of that out there. A lot of that out there. Ooh, it's shameful. It's embarrassing. Or I'm not really ashamed, but I don't want to advertise it to my friends. Tell me you don't see that flipping in real time to being shameful to vote for her. And so let's get on the list. What, what are the reasons? Because there are reasons. What are the reasons? Why is she so bad? First of all, she's dumb. Now, there's different kinds of dumb, keep in mind. There are different types of people, and you have to decide for yourself whether you consider one dumb or not. There are people who are intelligent with other people, and psychologists have all the IQ, EQ stuff, but there are just people who are just, you get them in a room, and they're Mr. Charisma, and everyone loves them. All the men want them. All the women want them. Or, wait, I said that wrong. All the men want to be them. All the women want them. It's just, there are those guys who are great with people, but you put them in front of calculus, they couldn't do it to save their lives. And then there are people who can do calculus all day, every day, but you ask them to have a five-minute conversation with somebody, they can't do it. The words don't come up, they can't do it. So dumb is a strong way to put it. What I mean when I talk about Kamala Harris being dumb, it's not actually a reference to her IQ. It's really genuinely not. Her brain has atrophy because she hasn't used it. She's never had to use it. She came up in the California Democrat-run system, and she came up as a minority woman in the California Democrat-run system. That is the ultimate leg up in any Democrat state like California. She's a Democrat, check. Wait, she's a minority, whoa, check. Wait, she's a woman, whoa, just hand her the office, check. And so as a result, we know this from studying her career now, she has never had really, really tough questions 
She's never had to sit down and do a town hall and answer hard questions. She's never had hard hitting media interviews. She's always been able to essentially do the, I'm a minority woman and a Democrat. Every answer has always been a version of that for the entirety of her, of her career, all the way up to California Senate, California AG. She didn't even really have to do much to be VP because no one really gives a crap about the VP. Well, now she's under the bright lights. She's on the main stage and she gets asked questions and we all make fun of her for these word salad answers, but her brain, you know, she's 60 years old, give or take a year. Her brain just has never been used. Some voters though might ask, you've been in the White House for, for four years, you were vice president, not the president, but why wasn't any of that done for the last four years? Well, there was a lot that was done, but there's more to do, Anderson. And, and I'm pointing out things that need to be done that haven't been done, but need to be done. <laughs> she never says anything. Why? I, I know it's crazy. She doesn't know how. That, uh, you have kids, younger kids? Today, because of social media, because of iPhones and things like that, you have to be more focused. I have to be more focused with my kids and teaching them how to have conversations because that used to be something that happened naturally for kids, but it doesn't anymore. So you have to teach them how to speak, how to have a conversation, ask questions of others. You know, they have to learn it. Otherwise, they will never know. That's Kamala Harris when it comes to answering tough questions. She's never done it. No one taught her how. It's never been a necessity. She simply can't. And that also brings me to my next point on why she's going to lose. It's her personality. I hate this about politics. Maybe you hate it about politics, but oftentimes politics is a personality contest. It really is. We don't, we don't want that. And frankly, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the vote for prom king, for prom queen, but that's really what it is. Dome doesn't have one. You've been reluctant to lean into, to talk about the historic nature of your candidacy on the campaign trail. Why is that? Well, I'm clearly a woman. <laughs> I don't need to point that out to anyone. It's not funny. Why she do all that laughing? <laughs> Why all the time at inappropriate times? She's never had to develop a personality either. You ever hear, remember those dumb blonde jokes? I don't even know if those are around anymore, but when I was a kid, there were all these hilarious dumb blonde jokes. And the, the whole thing was, oh, blondes are dumb, blondes are dumb, blonde women are dumb. That was the idea, the, the idea behind the joke. Well, why was that a thing? It's not always true, obviously, but why was that a, a stereotype? Well, because, well, she's so hot, she's never had, had to learn anything, never had to develop a personality. And now she doesn't have one at all. That was kind of the essence behind it. That's Kamala Harris for different reasons, but that's Kamala Harris. And people hate that. People will vote for the most despicable policies in the world if they like your personality. Ask Barack Obama, that's how he got elected. So that's a big reason she's gonna lose. Another reason is simply this, the tangibles. You and me, we're political people. So we care about things that, I don't wanna say small, they're not small, but we care about things that the average norm, the norma, the average voter doesn't care about. But everyone cares about prices. Everyone now, they're looking at their bank account. They're looking at how their money just doesn't go as far. And they're angry, they're depressed, they're sad, whatever. And Kamala Harris doesn't have a good answer for these questions. I am very clear. Cost of groceries still too high. The voters know it. I know it. What? You've been in power for four years. What, what, does that, what does that mean? So that's one thing people are angry about. The second thing norms and normas are angry about is all the illegals. They have eyes. They see. Even if they don't know what you know about politics, they understand when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris got elected, the border got thrown wide open, and she doesn't have an answer. I have personally prosecuted everything from low-level offenses to homicides. I know what a crime looks like. And I will tell you, an undocumented immigrant is not a criminal. She's on record, wanting them to be here. Tons of video. So now she has no answer. Oh, you're angry about illegal immigration? Uh, uh, me too. She doesn't have an answer. And finally, 
the radicalism of the tranny stuff. How, how long have you been watching this show? Because this is something I've talked about for the longest time, that embracing the tranny madness, it was a colossal mistake on the part of the Democrat Party because it's such a minuscule portion of the population. That's one reason. The second reason is it grosses people out. It just simply does. I know your liberal Aunt Peggy acts like she loves them. Even she doesn't want to walk beside the guy in Target who's 6'5", with a dress on and his penis hanging out the bottom. She doesn't. It grosses her out. She's weirded out. Everyone thinks it's gross and weird. And yet the Democrats have decided to embrace this. And now the Democrat nominee for president is on camera saying things like this. They were standing in the way of, of, of surgery. Um, for prisoners. Uh, for prisoners. And there was a specific case. And when I learned about the case, I worked behind the scenes to not only make sure that that transgender woman got the services she was deserving. So it wasn't only about that case. I made sure that they changed the policy in the state of California so that every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access to the medical care that they desired and need. That doesn't play well in an election. You look like a freak. She's going to lose. Feel good about it. That may have made you uncomfortable, especially the target training, but I'm right. We have Senator Ron Johnson joining us next. Election season is different for normal people than it is for you and me. I'm sorry, you're not normal. I'm not normal. We are hyper-political people. Normal people don't care about the, all the issues we do. But what do normal people care about? Well, why don't we talk to somebody who's gotten elected in a purple state? It is amazing that Ron Johnson keeps getting elected in a purple state because he's one of, like, five good senators we have. He's awesome. Joining me now, Senator Ron Johnson in the state of Wisconsin, Senator, you managed to keep getting elected in a state that is not bloodthirsty red like my state of Texas. You get elected in Wisconsin. Clearly, you're somebody who understands what people care about. What do they care about this year? Hello, Jesse. Well, first and foremost, what they care about when they're electing somebody or voting for somebody, is that person honest? Is that person genuine? Uh, they may not always agree with that individual, but as long as they believe that that person believes what they're actually telling the public. Uh, that goes a long way. So I think I've, uh, I think I've earned the trust of Wisconsinites. Uh, I made two promises when I first ran for election. I said, I'll always tell you the truth. I'll never vote. And by extension, I won't conduct myself worrying about re-election. And I've honored those promises. So you know, right now, I think in today's uh, environment, I mean, I think that's basically table stakes for the candidates. But in terms of issues, it's the pocketbook issues. I, you know, it is the open border, which is crowding out housing which is crowding out education, health care, law enforcement. Uh, it's flooding our, our streets with the uh, fentanyl and, and methamphetamine, uh, dangerous drugs killing Americans. I mean, pe people are experiencing this. Uh, they know people who have uh, died from overdoses. Uh, and it's the economy. They, they can't afford things. Uh, and hopefully they're connecting the dots as the massive deficit spending uh, that has sparked 40-year high inflation to value the dollar from a buck at the start of the Biden administration, down to 83 cents. So to me, those are the, 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 main, the main issues right there, inflation and the open border. Inflation doesn't surprise me, although we can get to that in a moment. But the immigration thing, which I've always been super hot on, it does surprise me how national that issue has gotten. I've lived in California and Arizona and Texas, and of course it was always big in those places, but when I lived in Montana, when I lived in Ohio, it really wasn't something that ever came up. You're in Wisconsin. Last time I looked at a map, not a border state, but people in Wisconsin care about this issue now? Well, again, not a southern border state, but uh, no. Best estimate I have, and it's hard because DHS is not honest with us, uh, they released about 7.8 million people into the country since the start of the Biden administration. That, that's a number that is larger than the population of 38 states. That's the magnitude of the problem. And although we don't have a huge migrant population here, uh, we do have pockets, you know, 1,000 people in, in uh, Whitewater, which is a city of 15,000, uh, definitely overwhelmed their law enforcement and education systems. 
But again, it's, it's the drug trafficking. We used to have a, a basic uh, drug trafficking hub in Chicago. Now we have multiple hubs in Wisconsin. And, and again, people see that. They feel that when uh, somebody, when one of their sons or daughters uh, die of an overdose, so they know somebody who, who does. So you know, they, they definitely are aware of that. Senator, let's go back to the pocketbook issues you brought up in the very beginning. You mentioned you hope people are making the connection between Washington spending and inflation. I think people feel inflation and they blame Washington, but maybe specifically they don't know what the cause is. But am I, am I speaking out of turn there? You're the one out there talking to normal people. Do they get that it's every trillion dollar bill and two trillion dollar deficit? That's the reason you can't afford eggs anymore? You know, in one side of the brain, they might acknowledge that. But on the other side of the brain, they love getting free federal money. Of course, it's not free, but uh, you know, everybody loves you know, the earmarks. You know, Tammy Baldwin has uh, you know, brought home close to three quarters of billions of dollars worth of earmarks. I, I don't vote for earmarks. I don't request any. Uh, and so that's a pretty popular thing to do. So that's a real problem. You know, the other issues I should mention, and because this is on people's radar screen, you know, again, just these insane social issues. The, the fact that now biological males are competing with their girls and being forced, you know, or being allowed to shower in their locker rooms and use their bathrooms. I mean, the vast majority of Americans believe that is insane. That is crazy. That was being normalized by the radical left, by the Democrat Party, by their allies in the media, uh, to the point where, you know, one of these biological males gets named Woman of the Year. I mean, this, this is crazy town. Uh, and again, unfortunately, too many of our fellow citizens don't listen to people like you, don't listen to, to conservative talk radio. They get their... They get their news, they get their information from the legacy of the corporate media, which is corrupt, it's biased, and it's basically advocates for the left. This election that's coming up, obviously we're hopeful, I'm hopeful, that it possibly could be, I don't want to get ahead of myself, some sort of a red wave, or, or, or it looks like we could have a really, really good, a good election, but if we don't stop spending, it doesn't help that much. We get better border security, but no better spending policies, unless you tell me the mood is shifting within the walls of the GOP. Do they talk about the fact that the GOP really does spend as much as the Democrats do? Is that discussed at all? Oh, a few of us uh, point that out to our colleagues who uh, pretty well just shrug and, and keep spending. Uh, so that's why, that's why again, <laughs> I'm a I'm big, big supporter. I hope you make a lot of noise. You know, we need Rick Scott as our majority leader. Here's a serious individual very successful uh, person in the private sector, successful governor of Florida. You know, he, he wants to challenge these issues. I, I'm not sure the other people running necessarily do. I, I, so, I certainly know that Mitch McConnell could have cared less about uh, excessive spending. I'm hopeful with President Trump, you'll be a one-term president. You know, the fact that he's uh, bringing uh, Elon Musk into the picture, uh, hopefully being part of his administration, uh, efficiencies are. I mean, I love what Elon Musk did to Twitter. We fired about 80% of the people on Twitter, and it seems like Twitter is doing just fine. Now, I think we take a look at the federal government, that take a look at all these uh, federal employees that have never come back to work. They're still tele teleworking. Sure they are. Uh, you know, we need, we need a, a top-to-bottom evaluation of the federal government. Let's talk a little bit about immigration again, because I'm very worried, as I normally am, about the GOP backing in this. And honestly, I'm worried about Trump. I'm worried about losers like James Lankford, Mitch McConnell, these, these amnesty-loving Republicans. We have Trump cave last time on child separation. We have to begin deporting people by the million, which is a horrible, ugly process. It's going to involve tears and arrests and all kinds of things that don't look good on television. And you'll have to forgive me, Senator, if I'm worried about the GOP's spine to actually follow through with any of these things. Oh, I understand. Uh, the first step is securing the border. I have no doubt that President Trump wants to secure the border. I have no mm -hmm. doubt that we all yes. be very supportive of deporting, you know, arresting and then deporting criminals. Uh, after that, we probably will need some law changes because people in this country now have legal rights, which we, which we as Republicans actually respect the rule of law. Uh, so again, it, it's going to get very messy. That's why I keep saying that the, the negative in, impact, the negative consequences of this open border policy we're going to be dealing with for, e for years, if not decades, to come. This is this is ugly. What uh, President Biden and Kamala Harris have done in this country, and it's it's not going to be a simple solution. But again, 
I think we can secure the border, I think, rather quickly. Uh, Trump knew how to do it the first time. But he's going to be hiring some very serious people, hopefully people like Mark Morgan and Tom Holman who know how to do it. Um, and then, you know, we, we absolutely have to crack down on the criminals. I mean, the fact that Martha Raddatz, uh, on this week with the, uh, on ABC with the J.D. Vance, when he, when he was talking about uh, Venezuelan gains taking over these apartments, and she kind of fact-checks him, Senator, it's only a handful of apartment buildings. <laughs> I mean, are, are you, I mean, J.D. Vance had the great, the, the best comebacks. So, Martha, are you listening to yourself? You, you honestly believe that it's okay to have Venezuelan gains taking over apartment buildings? By the way, Justin, that's just the tip of the iceberg. When I was chairman of Homeland Security Committee, you go down to Central America, the brutality of those gangs, I mean, we're, we're not used to that kind of criminal activity. The kidnappings, uh, the murders, the rapes, the extortion. Uh, you know, you're a police officer. You get a little DVD with the uh, videos of your children and wife going to church and to school. Uh, that's that's the minor uh, threats right there. If you're a cab driver, you either pay the extortion or they put a bullet in your head and they set your cab on fire. Then a lot of taxi drivers start paying the extortion. So that that's what we have led into this country. Uh, we're starting to experience that a little bit with uh, these gangs taking over apartment buildings. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Senator, what's the message to Wisconsin voters in the final days of the election here? What, what do you want them to hear from you? Well, it's the age old question. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? And, you know, I know we we're in the pandemic, but, but go back a little bit further before the pandemic recession. And, and take a look at what Donald Trump had delivered as president of the United States. You know, a record economy, wages were growing for every demographic group. Uh, inflation was low, energy prices were low. Uh, I mean, government regulations have been cut, taxes have been cut. I mean, those are the policies that work. So take a look at the, you know, actually what worked and, and vote for those successful policies. Uh, you know, even Kamala Harris wants to turn the page. Uh, she's just not realizing Americans want to turn the page on her and her administration. So, again, vote your pocketbook. Uh, take a look at who actually has a record and who has nothing but lies and deception, and that's Kamala Harris and the Democrats. Yeah. She doesn't strike me as a big reader anyway. Senator, thank you so much. I appreciate you, as always. One of the few good ones we have right there. I wish we could freaking clone that guy about 100 times. Anyway, we have more. Next. How much do you think we can rip out of this wasted $6.5 trillion Harris-Biden budget? Well, I, I think we can, we can do at least $2 trillion. Yeah! <laughs> Yes. Two trillion. I mean, at the end of the day, you're being taxed. You're being taxed. All government spending is taxation. So whether it's, it's direct taxation or all government spending, it either becomes inflation or it's, it's direct taxation. Your money is being wasted, and the Department of Government Efficiency is going to fix that. We're going to get the government off your back and out of your pocketbook. Well, I'm all for it. Color me skeptical, but I'm all for it. I did like that it was met with cheers. Joining me now, Joe Penland, better known as Joe from Texas. He's a businessman. You can find him at JoeFromTexas.com. Joe, okay, the national debt is a national crisis. People say they want spending cuts, and I'm glad they say that, but do they, Joe? Absolutely, they do. You know, the last two and a half years, I've visited with thousands, tens of thousands of people one-on-one -on -one and uh, may, uh, many more than that from the stage on the Tucker tour, which I seen you in Fort Bend, which that was a, a great, a great night that night. But yes, they want, the, they want, the, they want us to rein in this spending. There's no two ways about it. it. Inflation has just about got a grip on this country that most Americans cannot tolerate. But yes, they do want us to rein it in and they want something positive in this next election. Do we have, or I should say, will we have, after this election, will we have politicians with the guts to do it? It's very, very difficult to find those. Really, frankly, on either side of the aisle, politicians love to give things, not take things away. That's how you keep getting elected. 
Well, you know, you know, this time we have a president that's just going to be there four years. He doesn't have to worry about trying to stay and get reelected. He has the backbone to do what it takes to get this country back on track. I think he was on that course, uh, kind of like, I guess, Bill Clinton. When Bill Clinton got in, he had to get a handle on the, the spending. He had to get, a, a, I guess, a millions of people back to work. Donald Trump had that going. We had the best economy that this country ever knew. And then we got the China virus and and that it, the whole world has been backpedaling since that. But I think Donald Trump's got a great plan. I think he'll rein in this spending. I think he'll get a handle on that border, uh, go back and finish the job that he started on right there. We need to put millions of people to work in this country. But Jesse, you know and I know that we, we don't, we've got a decline in birth rate in this country. In order to get our economy booming like it needs to be, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to bring some people in this country like we did during the war, but we need to do it the right way. We need to do it like we did at Ellis Island at the turn of the century. We had 20 million, 20 million people came in this country the right way, started businesses, raised their families. You still got 38 million people in this country that have a tie to Ellis Island today. But we got to get control over the border where we are in control. Who comes, how many come, and we get to vet people like we need to. Joe, how big of a deal is the national debt? If it seems like people have always been saying it's a big deal. I talk about it all the time, but for a lot of people, it's hard to make that connection. $35 trillion in debt. How does it affect me, my life, my pocketbook? Why is it a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because government has are taking your taxes and they have to pay the interest on this debt. We're going to pay $1 trillion this year. Uh, we're going to go $2 trillion in the hole this year. The Congressional Budget Office has already said we'll go $2 trillion in the whole the next 10 years. Now, Jody Arrington, chairman of the Budget Committee here in Texas, uh, but, but nationally, he has a budget that it will take 10 years to balance our budget. That doesn't mean we're going to pay anything down. That means just get to where we start balancing our budget. Now, we have to do that. We have to have Donald Trump for four years. We have to have J.D. for additional eight years. So we'll have 12 years to make sure this budget works its way into fruition. We have got to do this. There's no two ways about it. You cannot continue to stack debt on top of the back of the American people at the tune of $2 trillion a year. We're borrowing a lot of that money foreign from countries that don't like us. That's a dangerous scenario right there. You look at China, they're aligning themselves with Russia and Iran. They don't like us, but they're loaning us trillions of dollars. That's not a good scenario, Jesse. We have got to get back a handle of our own debt. Well, we certainly do. Thank you. All right. We are going to talk about abortion next. What concessions would be on the table? Religious exemptions, for example, is that something that you would consider? I don't think we should be making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. To Republicans like, for example, uh, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, who would back something like this on a Democratic agenda if, in fact, Republicans control Congress, would you offer them an olive branch? Or is that off the table? Is that not an option for you? I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. No religious exemptions, you see? You're a Catholic doctor, Christian nurse. Sorry, too bad, so sad. Kill it. These people, you think we're not against evil? They tell you all the time we are. Joining me now, Abby Johnson, former Planned Parenthood director turned probably the best pro-life advocate in the country. Abby, these people, they've made an entire election about killing babies. I've honestly never seen anything like it. I've known, you know, abortion's the Democrat position. I, I, I got all that, but... They've based an entire election off it. They think this issue is popular enough nationally, they can win the presidency on it. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, and unfortunately, it has become so popular that the GOP felt like they needed to become, you know, really tolerant of abortion instead of being no compromise pro-lifers which is essentially what the GOP has been for decades. And so they felt like they had to moderate on abortion, which shows how much pressure the Democratic Party has put on our country to normalize and accept abortion. How, how did we twist up 
young ladies in particular so much on this issue. I know there's not one thing, and I know it didn't happen in one day, one election or anything like that. I realize there's a lot to it, but man alive, I, I, the numbers say, Abby, that a young, especially young single women, they will vote on this issue and this issue alone. It doesn't matter what else is at stake. How did we do that? Yeah, it's a good question, Jesse. I think I think one thing is that we have or the the Democratic Party has told women a bunch of lies. So they have told women that their rights are at stake. They have told women that their bodily autonomy is at stake. And they have told them probably the biggest lie at all, of all that if abortion is not accessible to them, that they will die. And they've used these examples of women who have died from abortion, like Amber Thurman in Georgia. And they have said to these women, if you don't have abortion, you will die like Amber Thurman. And they blame pro-life laws for women like Amber Thurman. They blame pro-life laws for her death. Instead of looking at the reality and saying, if Amber Thurman would have never had an abortion, she would be alive today. And so they're they're just lying to women. And they are, instead of saying pro-life laws are here to protect you and your child, they're saying pro-life laws are here to kill you. Instead of looking at the reality and saying abortion is actually something that could kill you. How could anyone be dumb enough to believe that? Mm. Well, I mean, the real answer is that the enemy, our enemy, which is not really Kamal Harris. I mean, the enemy is Satan. Um, the enemy is sin. It's very, very seductive. And um, it's very tricky. And if you say something enough times, people will believe it. And the Democratic Party and the secular media is, has said it so many times that people believe it. And, and then you even have these people's family going on TV, Amber Thurman's mom, who of course is a, a strong Democrat, right? She's going on TV saying, yeah, saying the pro-life laws are what killed my child because she's looking for someone to blame. Instead of saying the problem was that my daughter went to an abortion facility, took pills, to kill my grandchild, and that's what ended up taking her life. Because we can't actually call abortion what it is, and that's murder. And when you participate in murder, there are sometimes consequences. There are sometimes earthly consequences. And unfortunately, with abortion, sometimes that earthly consequence is that your life will be taken as well. And that's the unfortunate consequence of abortion. We can't escape it but they don't want to call abortion what it is. And they don't want to actually talk about the real risks of abortion. How many states have abortion on the ballot this coming November? How many states do we have to worry about legions of women coming out and voting on something? Yeah, there's about a dozen right now where we're looking at constitutional amendments um, where this whatever ballot initiative it is, whatever they're calling it, referendums, could actually change the state's constitution, which in a sense would wipe out any current pro-life legislation in that state. The one that everybody is looking at, I think the most closely is Florida with their amendment four. And so many of us have been on social media encouraging people to vote no on Amendment 4. Florida is, as most of us know, a pro-life state. Governor DeSantis, obviously very staunchly pro-life. Um, but people are now voting on, which is not how we do legislation, okay? By the way, this whole popular vote thing that's happening right now, this is not how we legislate, okay? But this is what Donald Trump wanted. So, Donald Trump wanted the will of the people. He wanted everybody to go to a ballot box and basically check yes or no 
on the murder of innocent human beings. And so that's what we're doing now. The consequences are going to be whether states allow, if people vote yes on these amendments in the state of Florida, if people go to the ballot box and they vote yes on amendment four in the state of Florida, they are going to be allowing abortion potentially up to nine months gestation up until the date of birth for any child for any reason and it could possibly be taxpayer funded that's what's on the line in these in these many states we have come a long way from safe legal and rare haven't we abby which was of course always a lie that was that was the gateway drug to bring us to, well, I mean, <laughs> where we are now, a Phoenician society of monsters. Yeah, I mean, safely gone rare was, that was simply a, a talking point. Because if we, if we think about that argument, Jesse, and I know you'll agree with me, but if we think about safe, legal, and rare, that on its own doesn't even make sense, right? Because... Yeah. The abortion industry has always thought that abortion was a societal good, right? Because that's what Roe was argued on. They said, if Roe is passed, if Roe is the law of the land, then crime is going to be down. Then, you know, these unwanted children living in these impoverished homes, it's going to be down. Domestic violence is going to be down. Um, child abuse is going to be down. That's not what we've seen. We've seen quite the opposite, right? So they've always believed that abortion is a societal good. So if something is good, why do you want it to be rare, right? Like I, I think steak is a good thing. I don't want steak to be rare. Well, you may want it to be rare, the temperature, but I don't want, I want it to be plentiful right? I don't want, I don't want it to be hard for me to find a stake in this country, right? I want it to be accessible to everyone. So if they believe that abortion is a societal good, why do they want it to be hard for a woman to, ex to access it? See, that's always been a lie. And that's how we know it's been a lie. Because their goal at the end of the day has been for abortion to be accessible, accessible to everyone. And that's what they've been trying to do. That's why we see some states like California, where you don't even have to be a doctor to commit abortions anymore. A nurse can commit an abortion in the state of Florida. And it, I mean, in the state of California, and it's like that for many other states. And that's their goal. It does not have to be safe. It does not have to be legal. And they certainly do not want it to be rare. They just want Good. access. And if that means the woman dies, they're fine with that. As long as she was able to kill her child, that's the only thing that matters. What a place we're at. Abby, you are the best. Thank you. Come back soon. All right. Final thoughts. Next. Okay, let's wrap this up. Elections, they're about issues. I know that's really shocking, but political people like us, we oftentimes lose sight of what the issues are. Now, here's the truth. The issues you care about the most are probably the most important issues. The issues I care about the most are probably the most important issues. Honestly, the national debt. Uh, the national debt, is there a more boring topic than the national debt. There's not. There's not. No one wants to talk about the debt. No one really cares about the debt. They care about inflation, but the national debt will end the country. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of issues that are really frightening. The national debt and illegal immigration will end the country. But you can't necessarily campaign on the national debt. In fact, you haven't heard either candidate bring it up at all. So yeah, issues you care about, issues I care about, they are the most important issues that are out there. But Issues like the national debt will not decide the election. It really comes down to this. If the election is about inflation, the American people will blame Democrats more than they'll blame Republicans, and Republicans will win. If the election is about immigration, if it's about illegal immigration, which people are angry about, the stories, the crimes, the rapes, the mortars, 
the murders. If it's about that, Republicans will win because Democrats are blamed for that more than Republicans, and justifiably so. If the election is about abortion, well, there are a bunch of demonic women in this country who want to murder their babies, and we will lose the election. What are the issues that are going to actually move the needle? Well, that's where we are. All right? All right. We'll do it again.